Thank you, Pastor. Good morning, everybody. How are y'all doing today? Sometimes you can have some nerves right before you get ready to speak or preach. But sometimes there's like a worship service beforehand where the name of Jesus is just like exalted. Like, like it's not about anybody on this stage, and it's really not about anything that's going on about here. It's just like, man, when Christians get together and proclaim the name of Jesus, there's just like something that changes in the atmosphere. Amen. Man, that's that's what that's what I felt in worship today. It was his presence was here. Whenever his name is lifted up, man, I was gonna say magic stuff happens, but that's ridiculous, man. Spiritual stuff happens. Amazing stuff happens, and it's nothing that a man can take credit for. It's just all the glory goes to him. Um, so, we've been in a one thing series. One thing. Um, I like sermons that really focus on one thing. And why do I like that? Because I am an overthinker. Do we have any overthinkers in the house? Maybe you don't want to raise your hand, but because um, you're overthinking, should I raise my hand or not? Um, and, and I am an overthinker. Like, just, it's the way I'm wired and, uh, my poor wife has to deal with that. Um, but, uh, and so that being the case, if there's like a lot of points in a sermon, I can kind of think a lot on each of them. Sometimes even in my own personal life, recently I was, it was kind of a time of ministry that was going on. And I had a friend of mine who kind of gave me an encouraging slash challenging word, an encouraging, challenging word. And, and at first I received it and, and the word encouraged me because he said, hey, you know, this it was, it was kind of prophetic. I wouldn't say it was like, thus saith the Lord, but he just kind of spoke in this moment. It was like, this is a word from God, you know? And, and, uh, and I accepted it, and he said, man, this is, this is what you need to look forward to. This is what you need to be prepared for. And I go, man, that, that's, that's awesome. That, I feel like that's what I'm doing. So I was like, man, encouraged, confirmed, challenged. I need to continue doing that. But then I began to overthink it, right? And so I was like, well, maybe I'm not doing that. Maybe, maybe I thought I'm doing it, but... But then I'm really not doing it, and, 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 so, and so maybe God had to tell him to tell me because I've got it all wrong. And you know, just that those, the brain starts going off. And, and so I, I had this tendency to overthink. And, and some of you might know what I'm talking about, and some of you might know what I uh, don't have no idea what I'm talking about. And some of you are married to somebody like that, and you have a whole lot more grace and understanding for Paige now. But, uh, so I can tend to overthink. But today, listen, one thing. We talked two weeks ago, one thing you asked last week, one thing you lacked. Today, one thing is necessary. And we're going to be in Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 38. And, uh, and I will say, of, of all the verses in the Bible, this verse has had a huge impact on my life. Thanks to our brother Dewey Davis. Dude, it's close to 15 years now. Whew. And you have to think back to when you were in youth group, and it's like beyond 10 to 15 it's so we start feeling it a little bit. About 15 years ago, Brother Dewey Davis was our youth minister. And on a Wednesday night, he shared from Luke 10, uh, and specifically verse 42. And the translation he used said, But only a few things are necessary, really only one. Mary has chosen the better part, and it will not be taken away from her. And he shared what that verse meant. And then every Wednesday night after that, we opened service with that verse, where people had the opportunity to share what does that one verse like kind of mean? Did you do that one thing? And then what did you get from one thing? And it wasn't just during his tenure. The two youth leaders that followed him did the exact same thing. And so it's a verse that's like a pillar in my life. It's one that I've gone to constantly. I'm excited to share it this morning. Let's start in verse 38 of Luke chapter 10. And now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity you've given me to share your word this morning. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would empower me to share the word that is from you. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would empower the congregation to hear, receive the word, God, and that we will all leave here transformed to be more in line with the vision of your Son and then what he would want us to be. In 
Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you're like me, you read a Bible story, you begin to envision it in your head. Now this one has, a, you know, just like a couple characters that are, you know, so, somewhat explained in Mary and Martha. And so you kind of like, if you're, again, like me, maybe you, you picture it like if it was a movie, who would they cast for the roles, and you're playing it out in your head. And so you have Martha. And Martha, she is just busy serving. Right? She's getting it done. And, and so you just kind of imagine, and I'm not saying it was this way, but what did Martha look like? Her, her tunic or her robe, you know, which she wore, always ironed. It was always upkept. Her hair, you know, always sticks, always in place. She, she probably had the makeup on. Everything was always clean. House always clean. Things always in order. Some of you know me really, really well. You've known me since I was a baby. You've seen me grow up. I'm explaining Martha, and you're like, Caleb, are, are you talking about your mom? Yeah. Complimentary. My mom kind of grew up in a Martha household, because things were just in order. Like, everything was always done. It was awesome. And so, like, I kind of sympathize with Martha. I'm nowhere near the level of my mom, but I can be a little bit of a Martha, right? Like, I'm, I'm like, okay, this needs to be done. This, this needs to happen. And then there's Mary. What does Mary look like? Her clothes aren't wrinkled. Just, they're not necessarily pressed to the T, right? What does her hair look like? I kind of imagine that the only thing she does to fix her hair is maybe go pick some sunflowers and make like a headband out of it. Mary's like a little bit of a hippie maybe, right? I, I mean, it's just when you're reading it, that's kind of the way I envision it. And so Jesus is just blowing up, right? He, he's in Jerusalem and surrounding areas and like there's just crowds that follow him and they come to find out like, hey, Jesus is coming to our village, which was a village named Bethany. And then they're just like, well, this is great. And so both are excited. Both Mary and Martha are excited. But then Martha begins to do the to-do list, right? She needs to make a Sam's run. She needs to make sure she has fresh flowers. She needs to make sure the house is clean. And so she's doing her Sam's run. She's getting all the groceries. And then she's in the checkout line. She sees a tabloid that says, Jesus draws huge crowd. And she goes, well, I need, let me read. And so she starts reading. Apparently, Jesus and his ministry had been to another house at one point. And this house got filled up with people. This house got filled up with people. So much so that this group of guys had a paralyzed friend that they wanted to get healed, and they couldn't get him in the house. So they had to climb on the roof of the house, cut a hole in it, and drop their friend down. And Martha was simultaneously saying, amen, and well, we can't have that happen. And so she, like, hires the neighbor boy with a slingshot to be on the roof to dissuade anybody who gets any bright ideas. Because you can't be, like, opening a hole in the roof, right? So Martha's just thinking of everything. And so then it comes the day, and Jesus is there. And then, man, he comes with, like, these 12 guys that follow him around. And one of them named Peter is just, he was a fisherman. And he just, he kind of smells, and he tracks mud into the house. And so, so Martha is just, like, she's putting people to work, right? She's sweeping and mopping and cleaning. She's got the crock pots going, making sure the lamb chops are, like, not too well overdone and things like that. So she's just like back and forth, doing the work, doing the work. And she looks in and there's Mary at the feet of Jesus. And Martha's understanding. She knows her sister. God bless her. All right, I'm, I'm going to do this. You just come help me. In this. Okay. So then she's busy, but she's making sure things are clean. That the site, leave your sandals outside. Don't bring them in. You stay off the roof. You know, like she's like, she's taking care of it. And looks back in there and then there's Mary at the feet of Jesus. And there's only so much that Martha can take. And finally, I mean, she's trying to do what's right. She's trying to do the good thing. But ultimately, Mary, that offense needed to be brought to Jesus. Amen? <laughs> and so, she goes to Jesus. Jesus, my sister is leaving me alone to do all of this. So would you please, Jesus, would you please correct her? And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about me were anxious and troubled about many things. Is the lesson of Mary and Martha that we shouldn't serve? Absolutely not. But the lesson is, what's our heart in our serving? Was Martha serving because, man, she just, like, she, she was in love with Jesus? No, she was anxious and troubled about many things. Here's the thing. Everybody that's in this congregation right now there's many roles that we all have to play. It's a part of life. Husband, father, maybe you're a worker, or maybe you're also, what, a manager, so you have people you work for, you have people who work underneath you, maybe you coach a team, you're a neighbor, you're a son, but you're a mom, you're a wife, a teacher. 
We all have many, many roles. And God has given us those roles to serve in a certain purpose. But so many times we can get distracted with things that we shouldn't be distracted with. We can get anxious and we can get troubled and it affects us in the roles that we're serving in. But it's not always like anxiety and trouble that can mess us up. Because sometimes we're in a role where there's some power that's involved with it and we like that. We like to be noticed. You know, we like to gain like the respect of other people. We like that we can tell other people what to do. It could be any host of things that can distract us from the role that God has for us. And that can be a problem. So Jesus says, Martha, look, you're anxious and you're troubled about many things. But only one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen it, and it will not be taken away from her. So what was the one thing? Well, it said before that that Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. As I was kind of studying that phrase, sat at the feet of Jesus, there is a, uh, there's a greater sense of that word, and especially in the New Testament, it's used for disciples. If you are a disciple, you sit at the feet of your teacher, at that who's your master. You sit at the feet. I believe maybe it's Paul. I might be wrong because I studied, I sat at the feet of Cornelius, I think, possibly. Um, but that's what you did if you were a disciple. You sat at the feet of who your teacher was, and you learned from them. And so what does that tell me? That tells me that as Christians, if we're here today, and we're saying to Christian, that means first and foremost, our most important role, more than father, mother, husband, wife, co-worker, manager, our most important role is a disciple of Jesus. And so to be a disciple, what? We must sit at his feet. And that's what Mary did. But see, the, the, Mary, I'm going to be honest, not the best example of this. You see, there was somebody else who was a whole lot busier, who did a whole lot of stuff. I mean, maybe did more than anybody ever on the earth. But you know what? They still took time to get at the feet of God. And that's the example of Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, who came in the full power of God, who did the Bible says he did so many miracles that the books can't even contain. So, man, we can read the Gospels. We can see all that Jesus did. And the truth is he did so much more than even that. But even in his time of ministry, he still took time to lead the crowds and to go before God. And, um, and if he has to do it, so should we. Uh, one example, in Luke chapter 5, he heals a leper. And leprosy was a terrible disease in Leprosy, uh, it, it made you an outcast. You, you, if you were a leper, then you were, I mean, you, you couldn't live in the city. You had to stay with other lepers. You couldn't touch anybody. Wherever you walked, you had to say, I'm unclean. I'm unclean. And, uh, and so he heals this leper, and then he says, listen, I healed you, but kind of keep it on the DL. Go, sh go show the, the down low. You know, go, go show the chief priest. But it doesn't matter. His fame grows. And as his fame grows, it then says in the next verse, Luke 5, 16, but he would withdraw to desolate places to pray. In Mark chapter 1, it says Jesus is in a certain village, and he heals many. He heals all, I believe. It says all who were sick and demon-possessed. So everybody who's sick, everybody who's demon-possessed in a certain village comes to Jesus. He heals them all, right? So this is like, man, ministry's taking off. Things are getting big. And as that happens, it says Mark 1 35, and, very, and rising very early, in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. Again, the, the scripture's full of it. And in Matthew chapter 14, he teaches all day long to 5,000 men. This doesn't count women and children. You could speculate that at least maybe 10,000 people watch Jesus teach and preach all day long. Awesome. The day gets late, people get hungry. They need to be fed. He takes a boy's small lunch, prays for it, blesses it, it multiplies, feeds everybody to their full, and then there's leftovers. And then it says in Matthew 14, verse 23, and after he dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Time and time again, there's this seasons of great miracles. Jesus is doing so much. But even he, even the Son of God, knew that he needed to take time to get away from the crowds and what? have a relationship with God, spend time with God, pray and seek God. After he fed those 5,000 men and he went up on the mountain to pray, you know what he did after that? He, he 
he walked on water to go find his disciples who were in the middle of the storm and then calmed the storm. I mean, it just didn't stop. But the whole time, throughout his entire ministry, time and time again, what he made time to get alone with God. He made time to get alone with God. And you see, that's what's so important, and that's what we have to grasp onto because we have to realize that as Christians, as Christians, our primary role that we have to fulfill before we're anything else is that we're a disciple of Jesus. And to be a disciple of Jesus, what? That means we have to be at the feet of Jesus. It requires prayer. It requires reading your word. And that's how we get to know him. That's how we get to know him. The last part of Luke 10, 42 says, uh, Mary has chosen the better part portion, and it will not be taken away from her. What does that mean? To me, Whenever we fulfill that role as a disciple of Jesus, it empowers us to be able to perform in every other role that God has for us. Every other role God has for us. And so that means that what? We're going to be a better husband. We're going to be a better father. We're going to be a better co-worker. And, and, and as we do those roles, man, we're empowered. And then we're going out and performing those roles, not of our own strength, to where we get anxious, to where we get troubled, where we get burned out, but we know that what we're doing, God has appointed us to do. God has appointed us to do, and only we can do those things. And whenever we are living like that, we're kingdom-minded. We're building the kingdom of heaven. And when we build the kingdom of heaven, those rewards are for eternity. That's what it's like stirring up, storing up for yourself treasures in heaven. You know what? They're not going to fade away, and they're not going to be left on this earth to burn. Man, whenever we live that lifestyle, it has an impact for eternity, and man, and that cannot be taken away, because it's God's work through us, and that is awesome. I'm reminded of my, my last job um, before I came to work for the church, and uh, I began to get intentional with with relationships with co-workers, uh, and one in particular, it was a young man who um, probably didn't have a relationship with God. I would say I'm about 99 I'm sure. He had a, a general understanding, had some kind of bad church experiences growing up. And, uh, man, I was like, I'm going to befriend this guy. For a year and a half, I, I, I didn't preach. I didn't, you know, throw a Bible at him. He was just, just a friend. But, I mean, every morning, in my word, every morning, you know, trying to pray for him, show an example. Um, before I left um, the job, I had an opportunity, man, just through conversation, to share the gospel. I mean, just straight up lay it before him. I mean, God answered that prayer um, for me to do that. But he didn't respond. He didn't say, oh, let's pray right now. He goes, man, I'm going to think about that. I, well, I kind of feel like maybe we think the same thing. Maybe you just think it more than me. But, man, he heard the gospel. Um, after I left the city a couple weeks later, uh, he posted on Facebook. And it was one of those, uh, like, um, quotes that's in, like, fancy writing. And it was by uh, Diedrich Bonhoeffer. And the quote said something like uh, about a Christian man not necessarily being concerned with, with sin in other people's life, but being concerned about what God was doing in his own life. Um, it was a little more intricate than that, and I couldn't find it. And he, he posted that for everybody to see, and he tagged my name on it. He goes, man, I don't think of everybody I know. Caleb Crawford encapsulates that the most. And, and I don't say that to say, hey, look at me, because I'm going to be honest. I know me. And that humbled me, right? I was like, no, that's, that's not it. But then as I thought about it, I realized, you know what? That was me praying. That was me being a co-worker and a friend. And I was, I guess I was his manager to a certain extent. And fulfilling those roles in a way where he didn't see me, what? Get aggravated and go on a cursing tirade. Talk bad about other employees. Be part of conversations that I shouldn't be a part of. But he didn't see me being judgmental, throwing stones at him. And so he's able to see Jesus at work in my life. And listen, I'm flawed. I'm not, that quote does not really describe me, the, the me that I know. But the grace of God shown through me, somebody else saw God at work in my life. And, and what, and I can only attribute to that, to what? Just knowing that for me to be all that God has called me to be, to fulfill every role that he has for me, I must spend time with him daily. I must spend time with him daily, that I must, because I have to be a disciple first before I can be anything else. And so the good portion cannot be taken away. And that's what happens when we build the kingdom. 
uh, the truth is, um, as you're sitting here today, hopefully you're kind of thinking about some roles you're in. And maybe you're thinking about some hardships that you're going through. Maybe you're thinking about times that have been challenging. Or maybe you're in the middle of doing something that you absolutely hate. And you're just like, God, let this drop away from me. Maybe there's some relationships in your life that you don't necessarily like that you have in your life right now. But God has put them there for a reason. It could be any host of things. And, and you know what needs to happen. You know, you know, man, this person needs to hear this. Or I, I know I need to be this way. And you're struggling with it. At youth camp, I had that. It was one of the, the last uh, last nights, and we had had night chapel when we were breaking out into our solo sessions. And Austin referenced this when he talked a couple weeks ago. I don't know if you were here or if you remember, but he, he told me that Caleb was pulling like a Rambo. He was out in the woods praying by himself, walking around, looking kind of crazy. I appreciate that because Rambo is pretty masculine. I guarantee you I, it was, I was like crying, so it wasn't like, I don't think Rambo cried. Um. Um, anyways, but uh, this was the thing. Amanda had talked to the leadership, and we knew God had done amazing stuff, but there was more for him to do, right? We knew there was more for him to do. And, um, and so what do you say? And so, like, my heart was to say the right thing or do the right thing, right? Like, Caleb, you're a pastor. This is your moment. You know, the Spirit's moving. What are you going to say? What are you going to do? What does God have for you to, to speak? And, and so I remember just praying in my heart, like I was just talking to God, and I was like, don't judge me for this, and maybe you will, and you'll think less of me, but I honestly said this, God, maybe I could just, I could, I'm so, I'm so just ramped up, I just want to, just want to hit the youth with, with what you want to do in their life, maybe if I could just use, just like a mediocre swear word, like PG-13, not, not R, but just like, just to grab their attention, to know them, know that I mean business, God, right, that would, you would check that one off, I mean, maybe you think it sounds ridiculous, but I was like amped up, I was like, God, I know that you want to do great things, stop being Martha, you need to stop being anxious, you need to stop being troubled, and you need to go off and you need to talk to me. And so what I go and I sit before the feet of Jesus and I pray and God my heart, what what's up with it? Something's not right. And uh, I felt God I mean I know he spoke to me clear, clearly. I mean it wasn't audible but it was just that peace that comes whenever you hear God. And he said, Listen Caleb, you work at a church. You're a pastor. It's your job. Um you get paid to do right now. I, I appreciate, I called you to do that, so I appreciate you doing that. Thank you, God. Um, he goes, but here's the thing. There's no worship service that you could lead. There's no song you could sing. There's no message that you could ever preach that could change somebody's life. Let me just take that weight off of you. No matter if you were in a room full of atheists and you presented the gospel and they all stood up clapping and, and they all ran down, ran down to the altar to get saved, um, if, if it's a for real change, if they truly become disciples of Jesus, you didn't do anything, but you were my vessel. And so sometimes as my vessel, I'm going to work through you, and sometimes as my vessel, I'm going to put you over here, and you're going to watch me just work through other people because I'm God, and that's what I do. So you don't worry about trying to throw strong language, about trying to figure out the right fairies or pull the Bible verse. I'm going to do my work in those kids, and you're going to watch it because that's what it's about. Because we all have roles that we're supposed to do. And sometimes we're overwhelmed, and sometimes we have so much of our own strength, and we've found success at different times where we feel like, man, if we can just say this thing, if we can just, if, if, all right, if, I, if they can just see it my way, if they can just, if, if, like, if the strength of personality, and we get anxious, and we get troubled, and then we're just Martha. And we're supposed to be servants. We are. But our first role is as a disciple. And that disciple is at Jesus' feet. And before we just get all bullheaded and we're just running in every which way, trying to make sure if you see it my way, no, I've got the revelation, let me give it to you. And we're like trying to stuff it in somebody's head. We need to know that at the feet of Jesus, like, man, God revealed it to us because it was his will to do it. And God's going to reveal it to others because it's his will to do it. And we don't need to try to force anybody into anything because it might hinder the work that God's trying to do in a much more subtle and long-lasting way. But how do we know that? Or how do we do that? We do it by realizing before we're anything else, if we claim to be Christians, our first role is as a disciple. And as a disciple, our place is to sit down at the feet of Jesus. When you talk about having a personal quiet time, I honestly feel like it, it's kind of like if you do it, you're like, man, I'm encouraged because I do that. 
if you don't, you know that you need to. And it's kind of like eating right or working out. Like, it's going to start Monday. Um, but man, life can get so busy. So some of you here, man, you have a good quiet time. That's awesome. Some of you here, you're struggling. We have little devotions in the back called the Daily Bread. They're excellent. Very, very short, good little Bible thing. Some of you are like, man, I don't even know if I can fit that in. Begin to redeem time with the Lord. If it's like, okay, if you're like, oh, only, oh, the only time I have quiet is in the car on the way to work. Pray on your way to work. Pray for your wife. Pray for your kids. Pray for those that you love and, and just pray that God would use you and guide you. If, if you're like, I have to listen to whatever radio show because like they just gets me in the right mindset, they go on commercial breaks. So in commercial breaks, turn off the radio. Pray, just let it start short. And don't do it because you have to. Like, oh, I have to work out. I have to eat right. I have to do my quiet time. And do it because we get to. And what do we, what do, we get to do? We get to sit at the feet of of Jesus. And we get to have relationship with Jesus. And when, when you do that, and then you read your Bible, like, oh, there's stuff in the Bible that's hard to understand. And there's views that we have to have, and, there, and there's, and there's, I mean, and you're like, well, do I have the right one? Well, this person's saying that, this person's saying that. I honestly believe if you with a sincere and open heart sit before the feet of Jesus, you pray for his word to be revealed, the Holy Spirit's going to reveal to you the right way of thinking. He will bring mentors, the right mentors, into your life for you to have relationship and fellowship with. Man, it, it'll work out, but it all starts with realizing that a relationship with God, that our role as a disciple is paramount, that is most important, and we must be sit at his feet. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up, and I'm going to share one more thing, and I'm, it could possibly be that this is me getting into a case of overthinking, but as I was preparing for this message, and, and I've known for a couple weeks I would be sharing at it, um, sharing from this scripture. Um, there was one thing that kind of troubled me a little bit in saying this, because this is what I've been saying. Man, you must be a disciple. You must have a relationship with Jesus, right? That's what it fouls that. That's the one thing that is necessary. That before anything else that we do, before any other role we try to fill, man, we have a relationship with Jesus. We spend time with Jesus. But there's this movement in Christianity today. I read articles like every week where people who fall under the Christian umbrella, right, put quotes on that, whether they be worship leaders or pastors at certain churches, want to make much of the name of Jesus. I have a relationship with Jesus. I love what Jesus taught. Jesus was, was so great. Jesus only really ever got mad at the religious people, at the sinner. He accepted them. And Man, I, I probably agree with some of that, but the logic and the line of thinking is toxic because what it begins to do is even though they glorify Jesus, there's stuff in the Old Testament and there's stuff after the Gospels in the New Testament that they want to say, I mean, I don't really necessarily know if that's what it means. And they begin to question, oh, they, they love Jesus, they love Jesus. And so before I say, man, it's all about a relationship with Jesus, it is, and that takes prayer, but it also takes reading the Word and in John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The whole Word of God. The whole word of God. So when I say, hey, have a relationship with Jesus, I mean that. It is about a relationship with Jesus found through prayer and through the reading and believing of the whole word of God. It doesn't matter if it's something that's not politically correct that people want to distance themselves from. Man, we have to stand on the whole word of God. So when people say, oh, I have a relationship with Jesus, is that relationship filtered through the whole word of God? It's so important. And I just say that today because, man, I, I'm concerned for the body. And I love you guys, and I, mean, I, 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 I don't want the wolves to come in and get the sheep, amen? And so let's just be wary of that. But if you want to stand with us today, we're going to have the elders and their wives up here to pray for you. Paige and I will be up here. Um, one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the better portion, and it will not be taken away from her. What's the one thing? The one thing is that relationship with God. And maybe you, you know that you need just a refreshing you need God to just spark that again because there's been times where you've been in your word. There's been times where you've been the disciple and things have been good, but maybe you're just not at his feet like you should be. And maybe you've been in your word, but it's not 
to the extent that it should be. There's not that love and that passion there once was. Maybe you're far away from that, and, and then, man, we want to pray for you for, for any of that. Or just a, a confirmation that maybe you're in the midst of a role that's overwhelming you, that's making you anxious, that's making you troubled. And listen, what you need to do is just return to that role of disciple first, and then God, by his grace, empowers you to perform for his glory and for his kingdom. And man, whenever we do that, what comes next cannot be taken away from us. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he is the great example. He is the one that even while on earth, he took time to be with you, God. He departed from the crowds, from all the miracles, to acknowledge you, to acknowledge his need for you, to seek you, Father God. So how much more do we as disciples need to be at your feet? God, that is the one thing that is necessary, God, that we would come before you, Father, before we fulfill any other role that we have. Our most important role to fulfill is as disciple of Jesus, God, so that we can just bring that light into the darkness of this world, God. God, that when we act in all the other arenas and areas that you have for us, God, we do it first as a disciple of Jesus, so that those that are lost, those that are weary, those that are hurting, God, those that are in need of salvation, see your work alive and well in us, God. And we thank you for that, Father. God, today as we open up the altars, God, those that just need prayer, I pray that they would come forth and we acknowledge you, God, and we thank you for your goodness and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.